Hi, I'm Louis Quell. I'm a photographer, uh, and I have been for a while a uh, professional uh, for many years, but also interested in uh, my own projects, short-term, long-term, uh, a variety of different projects, which you can see on my website if you ever get the chance to visit, but yes. When I first started photography, I think my original impulse was just to make a living. It was back in 1993, actually. Uh, and as, I, as I moved into that space, I suddenly found myself making a living. Uh, I, I started to think a bit more deeply about what I was going to do with photography and where, was, where it was going to take me. So, uh, so increasingly, my projects are more long-term. The audience has shifted from Once Upon a Time editorial to something which might appear in a gallery. Uh, and yeah, so I'm definitely moving away from uh, editorial into a different way of thinking about photography. Uh, just to, before I even talk about the project Big Brother, which is a project about my brother's, uh, my brother Justin's struggle with his condition, uh, which is schizophrenia, uh, I sort of, all the work I've done in a way has been leading to this work. Uh, when I first started photography and doing my own personal projects, I was traveling the world, and, and the better the work becomes, the closer it gets to home, if you like, and uh, so maybe my best work is, is the work about my own family, which is, is, is kind of maybe interesting for me or surprising for me. Uh, but yeah, this project is, is, is born out of a frustration with the way that Justin was seen. Uh, he was kind of othered by his condition, and I wanted to push back against that, really. The reason I made this book uh, about Justin is he, you know, he does have this condition uh, which is very difficult for him sometimes, but not all the time. But what happens in society is, because of his condition, uh, for all sorts of complicated reasons, schizophrenia, sort of, and everything that makes Justin who he is today, uh, it means that people tend to see the illness before they see the person. And I think even doctors and medical team who are just trying to help Justin solve a problem maybe, or he's, he's getting a call from the police and someone has to solve that problem, or his flat's a mess and someone has to solve that problem. They never got to see the whole person, Justin, and it was very reductive. So the reason, one of the reasons I made this book was to push back against that very narrow understanding of Justin and to show the whole person, to celebrate the whole person. And Justin's got so much potential. He's, a, you know, he, He's creative, he's into poetry, and he's got this amazing hobby, which is bird watching, uh, which you know, is, is kind of a, a, a central point of the book, which I'll probably discuss later, really, because it's quite complicated. Uh, and there's all sorts of things in the book which are important to discuss, which if I get the opportunity, I will talk about it. But really, the, the book kind of deals with this idea that Justin is more than his illness. Mental health is part of his life, but it's not all of his life. So my, my brother Justin has got a diagnosis, of, a diagnosis sorry, of schizophrenia, but actually he's actually got something called schizoaffective disorder. And uh, what was interesting about that, when I started uh, doing this book with Justin and, and I researched this term, I came across a, a definition of it, and almost every quality, every part of the definition was, uh, reminded me of Justin. It was disorganisation, it was psychosis, it was problems with hygiene, it was problems with sleep, almost all of that, uh, you know, delusion. It kind of, oh, that's my brother, Justin, you know. So, so schizophrenia is an umbrella term, but actually Justin has got this condition, schizoaffective disorder. Uh, so one of the reasons I made this book was also as a resource so people could understand what it's like to have this illness. And in fact, I'm lecturing uh, to doctors at the moment on lived experience because they don't have enough access to these sorts of, you know, materials, really. But, uh, yeah, so... This, this you know, condition, if you like, it, it kind of affects Justin in many ways. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, and we look at that in the book uh, in great depth. So my, my, uh, one of uh, my brother's problems, actually, is the fact that uh, uh, he is stigmatised constantly. People don't see the whole person. And uh, nine out of ten people with mental health issues actually say that stigma makes their life worse. And very often the... the uh, the experience uh, of some, the experience of an ordinary person who doesn't doesn't know anything about schizophrenia is, is when they read about it in the newspapers. Uh, you know, someone's been stabbed in the Daily Mail, or, or the nutter headline that you see in the tabloids. So, you know, I realised uh, if I was going to push back against that narrow understanding of, of Justin, I had to really go to town on this project and I, and I asked Justin permission to make a book because it had to be a book 
something which, which had depth to push back against the shallowness of stigma. Uh, now, I'm a photographer, so obviously my approach into it was going to be pick up the camera. And also I wanted to spend time with Justin, because this happened just after our mother had passed away. I decided to make this project, and she also had schizophrenia. And, I've, and I was kind of understanding at the time, I, I kind of regretted not doing anything about my mum. Uh, it would have been an amazing story. So I felt I had a responsibility and an opportunity to, to t tell Justin's story, and I had Justin's permission. All those years of photography, uh, all that experience, it suddenly came into fruition because before I didn't have the authority maybe to photograph my mum. I didn't have the confidence. I didn't know where the career stopped and the family started. Uh, so when I was ready to photograph Justin, I had, I had to use all my skills, all, all the wisdom that my career as a photographer had allowed me to, to build, really. But it's not just photography that I'm using. I'm using multi forms of documentation in the book. I'm using Justin's testament. I'm using Justin's poetry. I'm using his medical records, his police records. I don't just see photography as the, the end goal. I see it as part of telling Justin's story and I'll use whatever I can to tell that story because photography gets you so far. But, you know, if Justin t writes a brilliant poem which helps me understand how he feels, then why wouldn't I use that, you know? And actually in the book, we publish his poems at the back in a, an anthology. It's almost like a, a book within a book, like a literary hug, if you like. But, uh, yeah, so I'm a photographer, but I, I, I think the thing about photography is, you know, a picture on its own is just like a phrase disconnected from anything. Photography is a language. You have to use, you have to have something to say to use it properly, I think. You know, when I made this, uh, when I started, uh, when I realised, if you like, when I realised that uh, I wanted to make a book about Justin's life, uh, push back against this stigma, if you like, it was just, uh, it was a bit like getting on a train. It was the beginning of a journey. Me and Justin got on this train together and he gave me permission to tell his story. I didn't know where it would end, but I knew I wanted to push back against a very narrow understanding of Justin, a very reductive understanding, which uh, was either, you know, the otherness that he feels when he gets on the bus and someone moves away from him or someone crosses the street to avoid him, obviously push back against that. But, you know, as, as the project developed, I realised uh, it's actually quite a complicated uh, situation that Justin was in, uh, in that, uh, you know, for example, whenever uh, an executive decision at government was made, uh, I could see it playing out at street level in Justin's life. So, for example, there's, there's a picture in the book where Justin's going to uh, his old uh, drop-in centre called the Mirway, and it's closed now. It's been closed for years. Now, that was, th that was closed because of government cuts, because of government funding problems. Uh, Justin went there with his mum for 23 years. I mean, to just lose that facility is devastating, but people don't really know about that side of it. And the more I made this work, the more I realised uh, just how challenging it was for our society to, to look after and care for people and also to control them. And uh, the funding and the social issues really started to play out in an obvious way. Uh, that was one of the important uh, things that I, I came across in, in the making of the book. But the other really important thing was, you know, my relationship with Justin changed as well. I, I for the first time, if you like, in, in my life with Justin, I wasn't just doing something for Justin. It, you know, I was always cleaning his flat, I was calling social services, I was going to the police stations, whatever it was. But for the first time, Justin had given me this amazing gift of you know, faith and trust in me to tell his story. And that was, a, that was something which you know, I, always, I, con I constantly respect now. I constantly you know, respect that idea that he's given me something back really powerful, you know, that, that gift of trust. So you know, it's very important for me to respect that, really. But uh, yeah, so those, those two, the two, two things that come to mind, the relationship developed with Justin, and I realised that it wasn't just going to be about uh, Justin, it was about the whole of the society that Justin is, is you know, contextualised by, if you like. We get to the point where I've been working on the book for five years, uh, and, I, and each time I'm going to... I'm showing the work to people like uh, Dowie Lewis. I showed the work like three times, and eventually I had a dummy which he said it was good enough for him to take on. Uh, so we get the, he takes it on, we get it published, and 
the closer and closer we get to publication date, if you like, the, the more stressed I become. Because I'm really worried about how Justin's going to react. And, and, you know, all the way through this, I'm aware there's a big ethical uh, problem here. How does someone with mental health issues like Justin, which can be very severe, he's been sectioned three times in his life, how does he give consent? Now, and the reason, the answer to that is complicated, but uh, one simple answer is, uh, answer, I'm going to answer that problem with a question. Why didn't I photograph my mother? Why didn't I photograph her health issue? Because she had a brilliant story to tell. And it was more about confidence and, and not knowing, uh, as I said before, where the boundaries lay between my career and, and uh, my family. But by that point, I realised uh, that people with schizophrenia in society have a problem because no one wants to photograph them because of that issue of consent. They don't know where the boundary is themselves. How do, how do these folks give consent? But I had an opportunity through my understanding of Justin as my brother and his trust in me. I knew what would worry him instinctively. I knew what he was worried about. Justin very often, for example, talks about the bogeyman getting into his flat and stealing things. And he, he's very often a stream of consciousness. As I was making the book, I could sense what was worrying him and what wasn't worrying him, you know. So I knew that I could navigate my way through that properly. And, you know, uh, that idea of, uh, you know, ignoring someone is important because, you know, schizophrenia has been ghettoized, if you like, as a condition that doesn't get talked about in the media because of that problem. Uh, so no one's talking about this condition. And back, this was back in 2010, and people weren't even talking about mental health that much then. It has changed a little bit since then. So, so that kind of uh, responsibility was there for me. And, and I'm going to pause now, and I'm going to go back to uh, a time in my early career. Uh, so I was in Kosovo doing a story as a young photojournalist uh, exploring the war, the Balkan conflict. Uh, and it was after the war had finished, but I was aware that you know, a lot of the, the narrative of that, con of that conflict had been dominated by very dramatic images and of refugees and, uh, you know, fighting. And, and, you know, the audience had suffered a bit of compassion fatigue. So, so I'd gone there with this idea of treating the, the, or approaching the people of Kosovo like I would a magazine photographer in my own country, making beautiful pictures of them and then interviewing them with their stories. But I kind of felt a bit of a fake, because as a photojournalist, I hadn't really proven myself. I hadn't really published in that area. And I was going to these guys and saying, tell me what happened to you. And it was obviously devastating. And I did feel a bit of a fraud. But I got to this one family in, in the middle of Kosovo, and I, I, met, and I met these brothers who'd been beaten really severely uh, by uh, Serbian paramilitaries. And uh, they, one of them said, thank you uh, for coming to hear our story. And, and I realised then just that point of being there and listening to them was actually valuable for them on its own. And worse than being intruded upon is to be ignored. So 10 years later, I'm with Justin and I'm taking that idea, you know, Justin's been ignored his whole life and I've got an opportunity here to give him a platform, to give him a voice. And uh, I realised that was worth the risk of, of getting on that journey, if you like, and sharing Justin's story. You know, I don't know what was going to happen after public publication day. Would Justin freak out? Would he be really paranoid about it? But because I'd approached it with love and, under, you know, and always thinking about Justin first, I think it mitigated against that. And in the end, we, I think we both had a good experience. I think Justin felt seen, and I felt I'd done a good job making the book. So when I started making uh, this book, it was a very simple idea, really. It was to push back against stigma. And then gradually, as the book developed, uh, other themes started to uh, come into play. And of course, how I was going to put the book together. Because one really important thing about you know, being a photographer and being an artist, if you like, with a, with a story to tell, is that you, you have to be sensitive to your audience and their time. And I think that's the one thing that I can do as, a, as an artist, is kind of grab people's attention and keep grabbing it. So, when you make a book, how are they going to turn the page? Why would they turn the page? So I was very aware you know, of building a narrative which would tell a complicated story, but in a compelling way. And one of the, you know, I've kind of, uh, the mother of my child uh, 
is a writer, and I've listened to her develop her stories, and I think I've absorbed some of the techniques of uh, those storytellers, really. You build your character up, uh, first of all. You introduce the problem, which is the illness, if you like. And then, uh, as your characters develop, uh, you're solving problems and, or, and then creating new problems for the audience to engage with. And halfway through the book, uh, I've into you know, so, and also all the way through that, I'm pushing back against stigma. So if you like, let's, let's look at the book. First chapter is about the illness. And in fact, the first, one of the earliest pictures is Justin with his head in his hands, which is a bit of a cliche, really. But the idea behind that is to introduce the illness and the narrow understanding of schizophrenia, but then to push back against that with a series of surprises. And the first surprise in the book is that Justin's got this amazing hobby. He's a bird watcher. He's so passionate about it. So, all, so right, we're pushing back, we're pushing back. Then the next surprise, oh, he's got a girlfriend, and he's been with her since 1995, which is quite a successful relationship, really. Not everyone can boast about that. So, oh, we're building up a more complicated character. Uh, we're now we get to see Justin's poetry, his art, and uh, the depth is building now. But, you know, this, this is not a book, it's not a PR exercise. It was very important for me to show that all of Justin, all of the problems, really, uh, because... You know, like you said, stigma like, is narrow understanding, and the opposite of that is depth. So uh, I've got to keep the audience interested, and I realise that Justin and Jackie's love story is integral to this process, because what happens halfway through the book, Justin and Jackie start arguing, because Justin's been moved, he's, he's been asked to leave a flat because he was making too much noise. And... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful poem in the book, actually, uh, about that situation. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Neat and Mr. Tidy, I think it's called, and it's all about that, the nine to fivers and the obsession with the life that Justin doesn't identify with. But anyway, that's another thing. But uh, so this love story t starts to go badly wrong, and the police get involved because uh, every time Jackie has an argument with Justin, uh, she calls the police. Uh, because she doesn't know what else to do. She hasn't got any support from social services. She doesn't know how to navigate the problems in her relationship. So she just called the police. And every time that happens, uh, Justin gets arrested. So, so, so he kicks over a cup and, you know, off a table. He get arrested for criminal damage to a cup. And it's because the police were, you know, they're so bad at uh, domestic violence for so long. They've almost gone the other way now. So they're almost encouraged to try and arrest if they've been called out to a domestic violence situation. The system doesn't allow for any nuance. So Justin was arrested for breaking a cup. He was arrested for criminal damage to a cigarette because he poured Jackie's vodka over uh, her cigarettes because she was drunk and, you know, they were arguing and she, he thought she was burning up. You know, and all these kind of absurd situations. Oh, I couldn't get my head around what was going on there. But it's the system, the chaos of the system and the chaos of Justin and Jackie in conflict with that. And I realised there was a third person in this relationship, and it was the police. And so Justin gets arrested, he's get, he gets bailed, he's not allowed to go and see Jackie for 28 days. Well, the next day, Jackie wants to see him. You know, argument's over, she's missing her boyfriend. So, try, you know, it became like, will this relationship survive? With the police are saying, you're better off without Jackie, mate. You know, what's all? They'd much rather they just separated. And that in itself is a stigmatising process. They don't deserve to have a relationship because it's too complicated and too problematic. So I realised I could, you know, tell, tell the story through the optics of the love story. And, and it's not until the very end of the book you get to see if that relationship survives or not. And I'm not going to tell you because then you won't buy the book, will you? But uh, <laughs> no, but you know, and on that journey, I, I, I realised I can talk about different things. I can talk about the social problems, for example. The, the, you know, if the social services aren't there supporting Justin and Jackie, who are the service of last resort? Well, it's the police, isn't it, really? And they just don't have the training to deal to deal with that situation. In one uh, page, there's a photograph on uh, Jackie's door, and it's a control order, and. Uh, Basically, the order says no one's allowed to visit this person. This was the police response to complaints from the neighbours about Justin and Jackie arguing, or maybe J Jackie was drinking too much, or she invited someone over for a party. Oh, we'll just stick this control order on it. No one's allowed to visit, not even her own sister, because the police haven't got time to work, work out who's good and who's bad in this scenario. Bang. And that's the kind of 
you know, the kind of Orwellian response, if you like, to these really complicated problems which need uh, complicated answers, you know. So the social side came out in the book. Uh, the, you know, the love story was there, of course, and obviously I've talked about, you know, make, putting some flesh on the bones of what it's like to have this illness. But the other thing that I uh, discovered in the book was how important Justin's bird watching was. And that became like a really important part of the book for me because I didn't realise it, it was his medication, if you like. He didn't have any proper support from social services. He, he had you know, a bit of practical support for cleaning and he had his medical support, his meetings with his doctors once every three months. But he used bird watching like a, a drug, really, to self-medicate. He would go out almost every day, and even when he's depressed, he still went out of his binoculars. He would, binoculars, sorry. He would find the birds. He would record the birds at home when he got home, and he had the joy of discovering a rare bird. For example, it was a proper hobby. You know, it wasn't just a walk in the park. You know, literally, it was a hobby, and uh, this was the gift, if you like, I give back to the reader because I'm asking for your attention in the book. So I want to talk about all the problems there, but. At, by the end of the book, perhaps we can understand that bird watching is a really powerful uh, activity to, to help us through our own mental health issues, if you like. You know, this, is a, this could be a bit of a, a life hack. And I, I like that idea that I've given something back to the reader, uh, you know, because I learned that during the book. I didn't understand how powerful it was, you know. So, so hopefully there's a few things in there to think about. I mean, the system is a victim of its own... Problems. Jackie will call the uh, the police or the ambulance because she doesn't know what else to do. But she, she calls them when she has a panic attack. So what she needs is somebody to just, you know, pick up the phone and talk her down, or pop to the chemist and get her her medication. She's actually getting the ambulance drivers sometimes to pick up her medication. It seems, and it must cost our society so much. But because we haven't got, you know, proper functioning answers to those sorts of questions. We just let it happen again and again and again. And, you know, the police and the ambulance service are emergency services. They are emergency services. But because the social services aren't properly supported, they're overwhelmed, really. I, don't, I feel sorry for the social workers. They have upwards of 35 cases, you know, at the moment, as far as I can tell. They, they should have half of that caseload to really deal with these guys properly. So, you know, when I was making this uh, book, I was photographing, I would spend a day with Justin, I would photograph him, and uh, I would go back, I'd process the film. And this, when you're with Justin, you're often, I was often, I was photographing him, of course, and I was also problem solving as well, probably, and cleaning the flat. And you, you get caught up in the moment. And, that, and actually, it, it, when I'm asked that question, what's your favorite picture in the book? Or is there a key, key moment? Uh, or key picture from the book. There, there's several, really. But I want to talk about a, a feeling I had once when I got back uh, and I processed the picture. And I kind of realised it was really emotional for me for the first time because I don't see Justin's face properly when I'm with him. But for the first time, I saw, you know, 60, or was it 60 years, or just slightly less of 60 years of stress and of this illness on his face. And, it was, you know, that was a really emotional moment for me. The picture's actually kind of touched me in a way that being there and seeing his face in real life didn't. It was different, you know. But uh, there are key pictures in that book, some that I love and some that are important. One of the pictures, was, which has actually got uh, shortlisted for the Welcome Prize, was a photograph of J Jackie reaching over to Justin, I think. Uh, yeah, and it was a really tender moment. And the idea that these guys have a really important relationship you know, uh, comes out in that picture, I think. And, and why, why wouldn't they? Why shouldn't they? And I think that's a really important picture. There's another really horrible picture, which was, happened right in the middle of a year of the police getting involved in Justin and Jackie's life. And Justin cuts himself in the glass. And he's never done that before, to my knowledge. Uh, you know, and that was really important picture. So it was a kind of representation of a year of really difficult, stressful moments. And it reminded me why I was making the book, really. The idea of trying to leverage some self-esteem back into Justin's life was very important for me. When you're feeling low and you're feeling worthless and you're constantly getting arrested or arguing with your girlfriend all the time, there must be times for Justin where he just feels, you know, at, at his, 
you know, really just low. You know, so to, 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 to show Justin that his voice is important, to celebrate his poetry, his art, it was, it was kind of me trying to leverage some self-esteem back into his life, really. And, uh, you know, there's another picture of Justin and Jackie, which isn't in the book, actually, but they're kissing in the park, and that's lovely. Uh, you know, but, yeah, and the landscape pictures and the environment pictures are really important as well. You know, one or two of those. There's one picture in particular of Justin's, he's wrapped in a blanket, and he's surrounded by cowslips. It's spring, and he just looks really happy, and that's on my wall at home, actually, and that's a really favourite picture of mine as well, really, yeah. You know, when you start a project uh, like this and, and it, is, it becomes quite important, you, you know, you have an opportunity and a responsibility to share Justin's story to an audience of people. And once you embark on that journey, you know, regardless uh, of your own feelings or of Justin's feelings, you have a responsibility for it to be successful. For if it's not successful, your brother you, the person you love, it would reflect badly on them. So I understood when I started making this project, I had to do a good job. I had to be professional. Because if it wasn't successful, I would feel awful that I'd been wasting five years of Justin's time. So that's one way into understanding why, uh, you know, some of the pictures I took were quite hard, actually. And there's one picture I took uh, where Justin cuts himself. And I had to ask Justin to pose for that, because I, I, to get the detail, I had to use a long lens and I said, Justin, this is really important for the story. I just need you to be still. I'm going to photograph your cut hand now. OK. Uh, and he did that for me for a few seconds, and I got the picture. And those moments are really important. Uh, but I think Justin understood what I was trying to do. He always understood I was telling his story, you know. And that doesn't always mean photographing him at his best. It means photographing him sometimes when he's not at his best. But after a while, you know, he kind of forgot about me, really, I think. Not always. Sometimes he would say, oh, enough already with your camera, Louis. And, and you know, because I'm quite obsessive with my camera, to be honest with you, and I'm always there. But, uh, but he understood what I was doing. And, and, yeah, like I said, I had to take those difficult pictures just to do a good job, really. Uh, I mean, someone, someone said to me, uh, you know, they, they notice there's an objectivity to the book. And I think all my years of training as a photojournalist, I was constantly trying to give a balanced picture uh, to try and tell a full story and, and not to do a PR job and making my brother into some kind of happy schizophrenic. <laughs> you know, what would that look like? I do not know. But uh, I had to show the, the light and the shade in Justin's life. That was really important to me. And uh, I thought I was doing a really important job of being objective and journalistic. And, and the publisher, Dowie, said to me, uh, Louis, you tried, but you failed miserably, you know, and, it, and that's perhaps why the book is successful, because actually it's very passionate, maybe, and that's kind of, I remember that, actually. So when people ask me about uh, how I protected my own mental health with this project, uh, I mean, again, I don't have a simple answer. Uh, in, ter in terms of uh, mental well-being. I think that's an easier way into that, really. I mean, I, 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 all the problems that Justin have and all the things I have to do to support Justin are there whether I've got a camera in my hand or not, really. Actually, picking up the camera became a joyous activity for me. I mean, there were problems, but those problems would be there anyway, wouldn't they? So when I had the camera in my hand, I, I was almost consciously, me and Justin were doing something else. For, for the first time, I wasn't cleaning his flat. I let the flat stay messy because I'm being objective now, aren't I? And that was kind of joyful. <laughs> I was coming to Justin and Justin was happy about that. Sometimes he doesn't like me cleaning the flat. He said, oh, Louis, stop playing dad. You, get, you know, he shouts at me, oh, I've had enough of you, you know, cleaning the flat. You know, let's, let's just go bird watching. And I did that. And so actually photographing Justin was, was kind of, it was more joyful than not photographing. And we just, I just follow him around and he would take me to places I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, can we do this, can we meet this, can we meet this person? It would be like, where are you going, Justin? And we would go down the River Crane, and we would go and climb around the back of the Midway Centre. And it was fabulous, actually. And so, uh, in a way, our relationship improved. And like I said before, that idea that Justin had given me something for the first time was lovely as well. He'd given me that trust and that faith. And we were just hanging out together. And 
and I realised that Justin gave me a big gift because he doesn't really love being photographed. I mean, who does love having a camera stared at you all the time? But because we were hanging out together and having a different experience of each other, I think it was powerful for both of us, and I definitely think our relationship improved uh, because of that. So, in a way, uh, when people ask me, how did you protect your mental health? Actually, I didn't have to because it was, a joy, it was a joy for both of us, maybe, or certainly it added joy into our lives, yeah. How do you, uh, how do you build a, a complicated project uh, photographing uh, the issues of mental health? I do get asked that question quite a lot, actually, and I'm often lecturing to different groups of people, very often photographers, and, you know, when you start a project like that, you don't have all the answers necessarily, but you know you want to do something, for me anyway, I, I knew I wanted to do something about this uh, subject, I knew I had an opportunity and a responsibility, as I've said already, but, uh, and I knew it wanted to be a book, so for me, I feel like the first my first way into the project was just uh, to photograph, just to photograph Justin and his daily life. Then gradually, as you start that process, uh, other things come to the fore and you think, oh, maybe I should be using that, maybe, you know. I knew that Justin speaks in a very lyrical way and I knew he, he's a great poet, so I thought, how can I use this in the book? Uh, I can't remember at what point uh, I knew it was going to be multimodal. I was going to use multiple forms of documentation. It was probably towards the end, actually. But maybe, or maybe halfway through, I started collecting his medical records. Uh, and, and then I realised when the police were getting involved and I was there with my camera, his police records had to be there. I always knew I wanted to use his painting. I always knew that was important because I wanted to celebrate Justin. So some of these things are instinctive. Because, because I had the luxury, I mean, I set myself... Uh, a time limit of not having a time limit. In a way, I just wanted to photograph Justin and see where it would take me. And then halfway through, I knew it was going to be a book. Or I, when I say halfway through, I, I knew it was going to be a big book. I, I always knew I wanted it to be a book. I aspired it to be a book. But I didn't know I was going to get published. You know, it was an aspiration. Uh, but, but, you know, so, yeah, you're forming these ideas as you go along, really. Uh, I suppose that... That's fine. I mean, quite often in the past, I would go and I would go somewhere. I I'd get the funding to go to Afghanistan. I got two weeks. How am I going to turn something around in two weeks and 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 make some money? And then you go in with that. I had a formula: portraits, interviews, write a small introduction, and use the testimony of of, of the subjects that you've photographed. And that seemed to work. And that works for two weeks. Uh, but in a way, I wanted to do the opposite thing with Justin. In fact, I, I kind of I. I set myself some rules actually. I said, don't, I try and avoid portraits, try and make everything natural, shoot on film, make it harder for yourself. Uh, but, but it's a nicer medium and it's, uh, you know, because there was no time limit, I could approach it from, you know, how do you photograph your own family where you can, you do it quietly, you do it slowly, you do it with sensitivity and you do it with love. And film seemed to represent that in a way, in a way that digital didn't. Digital was too quick and snappy. So I wanted just to be there, waiting for the moment. Sometimes I would miss them, of course. I remember there was one time uh, uh, Justin got arrested and uh, oh, I thought I, I took my camera to the police station. I thought I should, I should get a photograph of this. And uh, I stupidly, and this is if you're watching this, do not ask the police for permission to photograph in a police cell. Whatever you do. Because I could have just taken the photograph if I hadn't asked permission. But I asked permission and they said no. And I thought, Oh, damn, I'm going to take the picture anyway. <laughs> and they're watching me on the camera and the police sergeant comes in and he is not happy. <laughs> and uh, he takes the film out of my camera and uh, he threatens me with some sort of legal <laughs> whatever. So, yes, my wrist was firmly smacked. A lot of the process went in, uh, you know, at the end. So halfway through, I kind of, I'm aware now I want it to be multiple forms of documentation. So I've, I'm starting to collect them. But how you thread them together is really tricky. And it took me three dummies to get Dowie, the publisher, to go, OK, we're ready now, Louis. Uh, and each time I'm refining, I'm using the different forms of documentation, the art, the poetry, the testimony, my narration, and just trying to thread it through and edit it down. So it's a kind of, uh, the planning is very much instinctive. 
but the production side of it, making the dummies, that's really hard work where you're really just trying to work out how to put everything together. So it's kind of two parts to that story, really. Collecting all the pictures, collecting the documentation, and then when you've got everything together in a huge kind of uh, pile of, of everything, how you kind of put that together. I remember sitting down with a friend of mine and going through all the pictures and saying, oh, we're going to keep this picture. Can I keep this one? And then you can't, Louis, because it's doing the same picture, it's doing the same job as that. You can't keep repeating yourself. So there's an expression called killing your babies, isn't there, in, in writing and art. And so I had to get rid of some pictures I really loved because it was indulgent and it wouldn't have told the story in an elegant way. So there's, there's that editing process. So I think it is, like, if you like, it is a photojournalistic technique of, of making the work and then editing afterwards, but with, with all the other layers made from super complicated story, really. Yeah. People always ask me, what do Justin and Jackie think about the book? Uh, and, you know, it would be nice to go, oh, they, they loved it and they thought it was amazing and everyone's happy. <laughs> but actually, to be honest with you, they're not that bothered. <laughs> they're not that bothered. I mean, I was there trying to leverage some self-esteem, I thought, into Justin's life. And I think I did, instinctively. Uh, but, but the idea of the book for Justin and being seen by lots of people, he's less interested in that. And I think, actually, the self-esteem I leveraged into his life came from our relationship, by me giving him attention. I mean, when Justin was published in The Guardian, he was like, oh, wow, you know, it was a bit, oh, my God. But uh, four and a half seconds later, he's having a cup of tea and a cigarette, he doesn't care anymore. So that idea of there being a kind of a wow moment for Justin and Jackie is kind of not really there. But shortly afterwards, they were really interested in the process. And, you know, and so quietly, they were interested. And I felt, I felt reassured by that, really, because I was worried that, it, you know, they, would, they wouldn't like it. But I think just being seen was, was, a, was a kind of, you know, good for those guys. Uh, and, and I think both of them felt good about it in different ways. I mean, I know because just, they both came to the private view, for example, so that was great. Justin came to, when, when the picture of uh, Justin and Jackie was uh, at the Wellcome Trust Centre, Justin came to that. And it was a bit too much for Jackie at the time. But, uh, so they've both been involved in different ways. And I think, you know, I, feel, I always feel pleased when I can take Justin to a big event like the Wellcome Trust and include him in the book. But most of the time, he's just getting on with his life and the bird watching and whatever it is he does on a daily basis. And, and this kind of world that I'm in is kind of, uh, is not really part of his thinking, really. But, but there's a, uh, hopefully, he, he's taken some pleasure. And, and certainly, that was important for me to try, try and make that happen for both of them, yeah. When the book was published, was I happy? Uh, I mean, there's two ways to think about that. One, is Justin and Jackie happy? Did, it, did they freak out? And the answer is no. So I was very pleased about that. And they were, it was generally OK. They, got, they were generally quite happy about it. And they felt it was OK. And it didn't cause any disturbance in their day-to-day -day life. Because don't forget, this book is getting quite a lot of publicity at this point. It's been in newspapers. I mean, Le Monde ran out over 10 pages. And it's going to different galleries. And to be honest with you, Justin and Jackie aren't that interested in that. So I was quite pleased about that, really. And it was always important for me, uh, making this project, not to overexpose them. You know, uh, that's why I, I made a book, maybe, rather than a film. And that's why I'm quite careful about what's online. Uh, I like most of this stuff to be in the book, because I think then the people who've got the time and effort to read a book, well, that's the right audience. I didn't want people to be clipping stuff and tweeting it too much. I didn't want too much of an aggressive online kind of uh, campaign, if you like. I always wanted it to be a gentle, a gentle kind of, if you like, leaking out into the conversation about mental health, really, more than anything dramatic. And I think I was pleased that that's what happened. I mean, it's quite interesting. I didn't get any, hardly any negative remarks. I thought I was going to get loads. I, was, I thought I was going to get loads of people saying, how dare you make a book? You know, who, what gives you the right to make a book about your brother? How, how can he give consent? And there were, you know, it got published in The Guardian, and there were a few comments actually saying, well, what, what does Justin think about it? And then people were saying, well, they were answering the question for me. They were going, well, actually, it looks like the book was made with love. And if you are going to make a project like this, I think the way to mitigate against the risks of a bad experience are to make the project and think very deeply about the person you're making the project about. How can you mitigate against the adverse effects. And I think by being very loving and positive about, you know, 
Justin's story and sharing Justin's story in, in an honest, so we're dealing with difficult things. And I've always been honest with Justin, so we've got to deal with some of this tough stuff. And I want to use your police records, but ultimately we are sh we're making an important project here, Justin. And I think he understood that. Uh, and I think, and that comes out in the book maybe. So people, when the people see that I've thought about this deeply and I'm not going, you know, back, bish, bosh, bosh, you know, they, they can see that. And so that I think mitigates from negative comments. So I was surprised by how few I had, especially in cancel culture with the stuff that goes on in, you know, Twitter wars these days. So I was quite relieved about that, that's for sure. Yeah. In terms of how, in terms of how uh, the project is getting put out there now, uh, I think, you know, I'm with uh, uh, this agency called Land Art Agency, and we, well, we've had this conversation, we've had this conversation about activism, really. And I said, well, I'm not an activist. I'm just uh, not out there with placards doing, I kind of see activism as something you do in a very quick way. Uh, but actually, uh, Elizabeth, who I spoke to, who, who's one of the co-founders, uh, she says, well, activism doesn't have to be quick. It can be slow. And I think, actually, maybe I am an activist, but it's, it's very much a slow process. So making the book is like creating a resource for people to access. And once I've made the book, I've actually been quietly surprised by how many people are interested in it. And it, and it works in different ways. So number one, the book acts like an exhibition. In a, so people can understand, oh, we could have an exhibition because all the content is here. So I've been invited to photo festivals in China and France. I've been in the Museum in Marseille. I've been in a London show with uh, Who's Looking at Family Now. Uh, and you know all these kind of things have happened because I think people can see the work on the walls of a gallery, and that's again it suits me because it's slow activism; it's not too dramatic. Uh, so I was happy about that. And then uh, oh, I've lost my way a little bit. Uh, oh yeah, so uh, activism. You know, when you when you think about activism, I think you think about two things. You think about the online space and the analogue space. And I think all the hard work gets done in the analogue space, actually. People look at things very quickly online. The concentration span is there. But it draws attention, maybe, to the analogue space. So, so having those exhibitions, having a book, which, you know, with the right people, uh, can be really important. So, so I'm starting, I've been invited to do these lectures at the UCL on the MBBS course to the next generation of doctors. And so I'm talking about Justin's lived experience, because maybe for all sorts of reasons, doctors find it hard to access uh, patients with uh, mental health illness because of ethical reasons. And I know they have a three week placement, but this is great. But I've almost doing their job for them. I, I've put Justin's life into a book and I can give a lecture dealing with lots of the big issues very quickly. And I'm really happy about that because that's the analog process. I'm with these guys who in the future will be perhaps running our hospitals or running important departments or certainly having an influence. So that kind of slow activism where you're showing the life of one person, why it's important, celebrating that person and then gently pushing out your message over the years. So, so even though the book was published in 2018, um, this week I've been on Open Eye looking at landscape and mental health. I've given a lecture at St Mary's University this month and I'm about to give a lecture to a load of doctors next month. So those sorts of quiet messaging is still happening. I'm very pleased about that really because because the photography audience is great and wonderful but if you like the medical audience is perhaps slightly more powerful in terms of having an effect on, on how we fund social services and how we look after people like Justin and Jackie. So that's that's been great. Moving, what's, what am I doing at the moment? Uh, I have I have started a project about the, about the environment and air pollution, actually, if you can see on my Twitter, on my Instagram feed, where I'm, uh, again, I think the way into art and photography for me is have good ideas, because if you haven't got anything to say, what's the point of saying, <laughs> kind of thing. So if I have got something to say, and I've got to think about a way of saying it that resonates. And I did this project on the North Circular a few years ago, and it was quite an interesting project about why people would left would live on the side of a really busy road, which is effectively a motorway. Again, it's the overlooked in our society. I realise I'm interested in the overlooked. But I did this project and I kind of felt it was, it was okay. It wasn't, 
it wasn't really resonating in terms of the, the language and the topics I wanted to communicate. And actually, I realised that air pollution was a big part of that project, and it wasn't really, I wasn't really talking about it powerfully enough. So what I've done since then is I've taken all the pictures I took and I've hung them on the side of the North Circular until I can get a coating of the air pollution, and then I've re-photographed them. And I think that's starting to do something interesting. Now, I think that the language of the print as an object is more powerful than the original photograph in a way. So I'm quite interested in exploring that and, and exploring ideas around uh, you know, those sorts of concepts which, which can make photography speak more powerfully. When I made Justin's book, I think it was powerful because I used all the other elements. I used the poetry and the police notes and the medical notes. And it was a combination threaded together that was powerful. So I think as photographers and artists, we have to think about our pictures. You know, sometimes there will be just one picture that's absolutely amazing and it speaks volumes. But very often, there'll be another way into using photography which can be powerful because of the concept behind it. So, so I'm experimenting in that space, but at the same time, I'm making a living. So it's kind of, it's a bit like wading through mud at the moment. But hopefully, in a few months' time, I'll get back to that project. And I've got a few other ideas as well, which uh, I'm interested in. I did a story for The Telegraph the other day for Portrait. I'm always happy to, for people to give me money to do work. So uh, yeah, so making a living, Finding time to make new work and interesting work, that's where I am at the moment, yeah, thank you. I'm really glad to have the opportunity and thank you very much to Wex for allowing me to talk about my brother and sharing his story and thank you to everyone who's had the time to watch this. Uh, it's really important to me to share Justin's story, you know, as you probably can tell. Uh, if you want to find out more though, because it really is best explored in a book, that was the whole point really uh, because I'm pushing back against a shallow understanding. You can get my book from my website on the shop page, louisquail.com. Uh, it is available and it's, it's a pay power button, it's fully straightforward. And that's the best way to really get a sense of, of Justin and Jackie, so please do. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Wex for allowing me to take part in this uh, series of talks about mental health. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, see you, see you again somewhere else. If you're struggling with your mental health or you just feel like you need a bit of a chat, then visit mentalhealth.org.uk forward slash your mental health forward slash getting help. We'll pop a link in the description or the comments wherever you're watching this. But on that site, you'll be able to find links to tons of different people who'll be able to help. If you're feeling alone, just remember you're not. If you need help, reach out.